I'm Marianne O'Hotter on the BBC World Service. Boss, we're going to this is the sound of a man being circumcised. This isn't a traditional ritual, it's a medical circumcision performed by a surgeon using scalpel and sutures. So right now there is no pain. We're in a village on Bavuma Island on the shores of Lake Victoria in Uganda. A mobile clinic has been here for a week offering free circumcisions to men and boys aged 10 and up. 21-year-old Wajuli is on the table. So I'm telling him to look at me, not to close his eyes. Eh? Removing the foreskin is one of the oldest and most common surgical procedures in human history. Around the world, one in three men are circumcised. It's performed as a religious custom by the world's Muslims and Jews. In scores of cultures, submitting to the cut is part of initiation or a marker of identity. So you're you're sque- squeezing pretty hard. <laughs> I'm applying a pressure so that I can, I can really see the breeders very easily. But this procedure is different. Wujuli's circumcision is part of a multi-billion dollar campaign to fight HIV. Research conducted in the mid-2000s showed that medical male circumcision reduced the risk of female-to-male sexual transmission of HIV by 60%. It's a one-time cut that gives you lifelong protection. So now 14 countries in East and Southern Africa are encouraging their men to lose their foreskins. It's it's quite a courageous thing for a young man to come in and voluntarily offer his penis for surgery. When the health education is well done, they come in voluntarily for circumcision because he has now understood the benefits. 10 million men and boys have been circumcised so far. The World Health Organization wants to cut another 25 million by 2020. They say it could prevent up to 5.7 million new HIV infections and 3 million deaths. So we are now done and we are going to to dress. (laughs) That is it. A a fist bump at the end of the circumcision. (laughs) After Wajuli has been given a pair of tight underpants and a few minutes to sit down, he heads home. The surgeon moves on to the next patient. Today, he'll do 25 circumcisions. But how can removing a man's foreskin help reduce the spread of HIV? Basically, what it does is that if somebody is not circumcised, it presents a bigger surface area for exposure to HIV. Dr Peter Chambadi is from Uganda's Ministry of Health. The bigger the exposure that you present to HIV, the higher the chances that you are going to get infected. But also that cover, the prepuce, it is found to have a, quite a significant number of cells that are targeted by the virus for entry. So by you removing it, you still reduce the chances of getting infected. But also by doing circumcision, you make the, the, the skin of the glands penis, which is the head of the penis, much more resistant to things like bruises during sex, some small injuries during sex that may occur. And that also contributes to the reduction of the chances of getting infected to HIV. On average, 380 people get HIV on a daily basis. 380 people get every HIV, day get yes, HIV. Which is totally unacceptable and it's very high. And among the young girls, we have 570 young girls who get HIV on a weekly basis. I think as a country, we need to, to step up and do better. Sylvia Nakasi is from the Uganda Network of AIDS Service Organisations, working on national HIV prevention. Although circumcision offers no protection to a woman directly, the thinking is that if a man has reduced his chances of getting HIV by getting circumcised, his sexual partners can't get infected either. The aim is to get 80% of men circumcised, and so begins the PR push. Obulam. I had heard about self circumcision, but I never thought it was something that I would ever do. I thought maybe it was painful. (laughs) I just didn't see the need for it. The success of the circumcision campaign across sub-Saharan Africa has relied on TV and billboard adverts, social media, celebrity endorsements and peer recommendation. But the message that sticks is less about HIV and more about sex, lifestyle and cleanliness. Yeah, the guys like the... Guys which are circumcised these days because they fear to get those conditions like cervical cancer. If a man is circumcised, 
Kale, for a woman, she can avoid many things like gonorrhea if he's circumcised. For a woman not to get that, your man has to be circumcised. What about sexual pleasure? It feels better if he's circumcised. You know, Ugandan ladies, they don't bring it out straight to the man. But I will hear it from the rumors. This guy is in circumcised, so I didn't enjoy. So that's why. So after you had sex, she was bad mouthing you to her friends about you not being circumcised. That's harsh. (laughs) So that's how it was. For them, it's partly fashion to be circumcised. Of, they may not be at that time be knowing the other benefits that it is important for prevention of HIV, but they feel cool. But we use that opportunity because, of course, they have come then to give them information about HIV and also about the comprehensive sexual reproductive health package that is appropriate for them. Could you not get them into the clinic without having to cut their penises? It would be very difficult to get them. For critics of the male circumcision programme, this is where the problems begin. The public health message makes circumcision desirable, modern, fashionable, cleaner. But how voluntary is it if you feel pressured into getting cut? And are you really making an informed choice if the medical messages have got muddled or forgotten? Would Julie, who we heard being circumcised earlier... I came here today because I heard about diseases that affect people who are not circumcised, and so I came so that I avoid those diseases. One of my friends told me that uh, before he was circumcised, he used to get uh, STDs, and one of them was uh, syphilis. But after being circumcised, he has sexual prowess, and he can perform very well, and and, uh, he does his thing properly. What does it mean to you now that you're a circumcised man? I'm very glad, I'm very happy. After circumcision, I now feel like I'm in another grade. Right now, I'm in a different class because I've been circumcised and I'm different from... I'm not dirty anymore. Circumcision has no impact on the risk of contracting syphilis or gonorrhea. And although circumcision can reduce HPV infections, which can cause cervical cancer, sexual behaviour is a better indicator of risk, along with poor hygiene. The greatest concern for critics of the African programme is the statistic at the heart of the project, that circumcision reduces the risk for a man of getting HIV by 60%. 60% sounds huge, but it's not what it seems. If 1,000 uncircumcised men had sex with HIV-infected women, on average, 25 of them would contract HIV. If a 1,000 circumcised men had sex with HIV-infected women, only 12 of them would get HIV. That is a reduction, but it's a relative reduction. Once a man gets circumcised, the risk drops relative to what it was before. It doesn't mean his risk of getting infected goes down from, say, 80% to 20%. That's what most people might imagine when you tell them there's a 60% reduction when actually it's a drop from a chance of 25 in 1,000 to a chance of 12 in 1,000. But the figure people talk about is 60%, and most people don't understand what that really means. Is this smart public health messaging, or is it manipulating the figures to sell circumcision? Barbara Nanteza is Uganda's National Coordinator for Safe Male Circumcision, or SMC. We try to keep it simple, such that the people, the masses, the communities can understand what we are talking about. But we know that it's a partial risk reduction. Or as we emphasize, circumcision is partial. You should continue using condoms. They should be faithful. And if they are not yet sexually active, they should abstain. That is the message in everything we do while promoting circumcision. But Barbara believes that this isn't the message that always gets across. In fact, there's a concern that people might have more risky sex or not use a condom because they think they're 60% safer than they were before. People might have riskier sex with more partners, with sex workers or without a condom. There might be those moments where you know you should use a condom, 
but you don't because it'll probably be okay if you're circumcised. A combination of behavioural disinhibition and risk compensation, as the experts call it. Some experts have even suggested that because of these factors, mass circumcision may ultimately lead to more HIV infections. But the systematic, large-scale research that could shed light on these possible unintended consequences has yet to be done. Uh, like when I hear the disinhibition factor, personal, I want to go out there and find it out. If I have scientific evidence, believe me, I'll do something about it. Actually, one thing I'm looking for is to get money to assess the impact of circumcision in Uganda. Even though it would be negative impact or positive impact, I'll take the result as it is and do better. But I'm only implementing in the dark. Uganda has had a mixed history of circumcision. Some tribes have cut their boys and men in traditional rituals. The rest of the country is slowly buying in to new reasons to cut, based on health and particularly lifestyle. The next step, and one the United Nations and the World Health Organization are considering, is to make infant circumcision the new normal. Sylvia Nakasi again. Uh, we're looking at that option as a country, and I think it's, it's under consideration. I don't know if it has been adopted yet, but me as a mother, my boys are circumcised. I have a friend who, who told me the best gift a mother can give to their baby boys is circumcision. It would have huge impact in the same way that vaccines do. Mitchell Warren is executive director of AVAC, a New York-based global coalition working to end HIV. For Mitchell, infant circumcision has potential benefits. Even if it means the owner of the penis isn't volunteering himself, his parents are. We know when we provide early immunizations for a whole range of diseases that babies don't get measles, they don't get mumps, they don't get rubella, they don't get polio. And if you circumcised all these young boys uh, at birth, you would see that most of them would never get HIV no matter what happens because of this great effectiveness that we know in circumcision. And it's certainly a long-term opportunity for huge impact. We have a raging epidemic. Two million people get infected every year with this virus. They've been infected at this rate every year for the last decade. We know that the tools we have today are not enough. Circumcision hurts. And to heal safely, you need to abstain from sex for six weeks. Both facts that are off-putting for men who might get cut. So if it's going to be done, the thinking is, the earlier it's done, the easier it'll be. There are countries that are looking at policies that would, in fact, begin to offer more routinely infant circumcision, or at least offering parents the chance to have uh, their, their young boys, uh, their baby boys circumcised. And all the programs that you will see in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa are very focused not only on the procedure, but on providing accurate information so that people are making informed choices. The United States of America is the only Western country that routinely circumcises baby boys for non-religious reasons. Unlike in Uganda, where HIV is at epidemic levels, HIV in the US is rare enough that circumcision wouldn't make a statistical difference to infection rates. In the US, cutting is cultural. The procedure was initially promoted in the 1800s as a way to reduce the sensitivity of a boy's penis to prevent him masturbating, an act considered to be a grievous moral danger. Advertising and endorsement, and the word on the street, made circumcision desirable, modern, fashionable, cleaner and healthier. And by the 1930s, with most babies born in hospital, newborn circumcision became routine the majority of American baby boys are still circumcised in their first weeks of life. It's a procedure that's so routine, many parents don't think about why they're cutting their boys. They just do it. There really is no clear medical reason to circumcise little boys. Dr Mark Sendron is a paediatric urologist at Boston Children's Hospital. Is it against the Hippocratic Oath for a, a doctor to perform a circumcision? I Just don't think... Fundamentally, yes, it's do no harm. That's right. So it, then you get into the issue as to whether or not you're causing harm by uh, doing a circumcision. And in most of the cases, you're not doing harm. The complication rate is relatively low. So 
what harm are we doing is very hard to quantify. Of course it's harmful. <laughs> you don't go around cutting off people's normal, healthy body parts and assuming that it's going to help them. George Ann Chapin is executive director of Intact America, a group opposed to infant circumcision. To make keeping a boy intact something that has to be defended on scientific or medical grounds is the height of absurdity. I mean, if all of a sudden you said, well, let's just cut off every child's little finger. The question wouldn't be, well, can you prove to me that that's harmful? But this is this huge exception. Male circumcision in our culture and in our legal system is this immense outlier. So why do Americans cut men? Once something becomes entrenched in custom, whatever it is, eating with a knife, fork, and spoon, as opposed to chopsticks, it unthinkable to most people in that culture that anything different is normal or okay. So I think that it's largely a function of status quo. It's really something that continues to break over me like waves as I realize the very serious issue and the very serious implications of what we do routinely to a million baby boys a year in this country. The American Academy of Pediatrics states the health benefits aren't great enough to recommend routine circumcision, but they're sufficient to justify access if families choose to cut on cultural or religious grounds. In a nation where circumcision has been the norm for almost a century, cultural grounds might be as simple as looking normal rather than looking natural. What were you doing at school yesterday? Uh, let's put some babies. You play with your babies? You play with babies at school? We knew we were having a boy already. And then finally, after our son was born, the obstetrician came into our room and he said, you know, with a big smile on his face, and he clapped his hands like that. And he says, so, are we going to do a circumcision? And I said, no, absolutely we're not. Anthony Losquadro is circumcised and a father of two from Long Island, New York. Well, you know, doctors and the medical establishment likes to say, well, it's always the parental choice, okay? But parents are laypersons. They're not medical experts, and they rely on medical experts for advice on, on what to do when it comes to a medical decision. All the information that they're given, that it's better, that it's, uh, it's going to prevent diseases, it's going to prevent infections, it's more culturally acceptable to women in the United States... If, if a uh, father is circumcised, his son should be circumcised, so they look the same as if that has any medical significance at all. And then they say, well, by the way, it's your decision, so what do you want to do? Anthony has become an intactivist, campaigning to change American attitudes to circumcision. He regularly takes a hard-hitting display truck to New York's Union Square. At the back of the truck, Anthony's placed out uh, an exhibit. It's um, a 3D scale model of a newborn baby boy and he's strapped down into the sort of restraining board that doctors use in order to do this procedure, as well as other procedures on babies. And it makes a noise too. We're going to gently slide down to the base of the foreskin, okay? And we repeat the process with just one end, go down and clamp. Anything that gets clamped gets cut. That genuine recording of a baby being circumcised draws lots of attention. Not all of it sympathetic. It's a personal question, but are you sure. circumcised? I am. OK. And have you ever thought about it before? I am happy my parents circumcised <laughs> me. I definitely do consent now. 18 years later, I give, uh, I give my seal of approval on that one. Why do you think it's necessary? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, in all honesty. I just, um, on a personal level, think that it's something that I'm, I'm happy that happened to me. I, I don't take any issue with having been circumcised as a baby and not having been asked. A lot of things happen to me when I'm a baby and I don't get asked and I don't have any regrets 40 years later. It's kind of between much ado about nothing, you know, on, and then on the other side of the coin, I suppose, is uh, or have we really evolved in such a way that the way we are naturally is problematic? I, know, I think yeah. it's silly because yeah. you don't think of it being an issue and those guys look so serious, like they're so upset that they were circumcised. But they seem to be very upset about the whole issue. 
you know, that's it. Do you miss I, your foreskin? I do not, no. <laughs> <laughs> For many parents, circumcising their child is considered a responsibility. Do it when he's little, he won't remember, and the healing will be quick. Making choices for our children, shaping their bodies, beliefs and belonging, is surely the role of a parent. Or is circumcision a harmful cultural survival from a time when sexual pleasure was considered sinful? Adam Zeldis is a director of anti-circumcision group Intaction. I'll never not see it as a human rights issue. To, to act like it's not, which we frequently do, I think is just a lack of understanding of what we're losing. Why do you think Americans are so attached to circumcision? Because it's been done to them. I think it's as simple as that. Um, I think this is one of those classic cases of the victims become the abusers, and it's so subtle and not the intent. Um, circumcision is often sort of done at with love, you know? It's like, I'm trying to help my baby not deal with the social stigma of having a foreskin, not have un, you know an unclean penis or diseases or, or whatever the reason is. Some people say, I've been circumcised, yeah. but I'm not a victim. Yeah. If you think that you're a victim, then you've got some other problems going on. <clears throat> yes, yes, all the time people say that. And that's, um, that's just one way to deal with the idea that this is harmful. It's really hard to to admit that you were harmed as a child and that you can't get part of your penis back and part of your sex life back. That's really hard to admit. I've had to do it, and I, under, I, I completely empathize with the, the millions of circumcised men out there who, um, who are victims but want, to, want nothing to do with claiming victimhood. Um, it, it does not follow the lines of masculinity either to say that I'm a victim, um, to say that something hurt me, to say that I'm lesser, especially sexually. And here we have a procedure that's doing just that, uh, and everybody wants to deny that that's what's happening. George Ann Chapin, who says infant male circumcision should really be called male genital mutilation. I'm really contemptuous of a movement that defends girls' rights to their intact genitals, their intact body, and their right to make decisions over their own body, which I fully subscribe to that would then say that boys do not have those same rights, do not have those same rights, that men do not have those same rights. People do not want to hear about men as victims. In this country, in the United States, boys are, are not accorded the same set of rights as girls are. I've always said, I wish I didn't have to talk about babies' penises, but everybody wants to keep cutting parts of them off, so I have to. <laughs> Do some people say, you've got to be a weirdo. You want to talk about babies' penises. Yeah, yeah. What's and I say, you're the one with the compulsion, with the, with the clamps and the knives. Uh, I'm just trying to call you out and say that this is wrong. Um, it's really as simple as that. I'm not the weirdo. <laughs> I'm like, leave the kid alone, please. <laughs> and there may be other reasons to keep circumcision popular. It has been estimated that uh, on a yearly basis, the health care expenditures for circumcision is in the order of $250 million. Dr Mark Sandron again. Do you think that's a reason that doctors are so keen to keep parents coming back for it? Um, that's possible, yes. Is that worrying to you as a surgeon, as a man who's devoted his life to caring for children? Well, it certainly is, and so far as I'm a pediatric urologist and I get to take care of some of the complications. So, yes, one has to question whether or not a procedure which is deemed to be routine and rather benign with low complication rate does end up costing quite a bit of money and does have some complications. So I do struggle with that. Infant circumcision rates in the US are slowly dropping, and by 2020, may be below 50%. The same year that international health organisations are hoping circumcision will have become the norm in East and Southern Africa. Even if new ways to treat or prevent HIV mean mass African circumcision is eventually no longer worth funding, perhaps the continent will be left with its legacy, just as people have in the US the belief that a man with a cut penis is cleaner, healthier, and somehow 
more modern. Adam Zeldis. We like to justify this behavior. I mean, at its core, it's so ghastly and awful and, and horrible. I mean, cutting babies' genitals, you know. I'd imagine that this whole push for circumcision, as far as the disease goes away, and unfortunately, I think what we're going to be left is the same thing that we have here in America, where people are doing it as a ritual, um, and an intact penis will be stigmatized the same way it is here, as though it's unclean or, or more capable of spreading disease. So I think that's unfortunately what we're doing there, is, is sowing more seeds of, of uh, future circumcised babies. Um, What's ironic about it is that it might go away here and be thriving over there, um, all because of ourselves. Mitchell Warren. I think that for anyone who says we shouldn't be circumcising African men, I I think I always have to ask, where are those pronouns? Who's the we um, and who's the male involved? I'm not saying every African man should be circumcised. And I have no problem with an individual saying, I do not want to be circumcised. I don't want my son or my partner to be circumcised. That is an individual choice. But I do reject that decision being made to say, then we shouldn't be offering circumcision. That is paternalistic and unethical to deny people access to information and to a service that we know can help protect them. I'm Mariano Hotter. Why We Cut Men was an unusual production for the BBC World Service.